I, uh, I appreciate that you guys, uh, that you give me a hearing at all. Uh, this is my heart's passion to speak uh, the Word of God. So I'm going to invite you just now to join me. We're going to go to the book of John chapter 6, and we're going to start at verses 47 through 58, and that's where we're going to start. And so there is so much, of course, about the Lord's table and about Jesus offering himself for us that there's no way that I can possibly uh, get to everything given in the Bible, so I'm not even going to make an attempt, but we are going to look at a few things. And honestly, okay, um, first, uh, sort of humorous, I guess. Uh, without trying to be mean about the Lord's table or irreverent about the Lord's table, you guys need to try to talk while doing that. Okay, that's actually... <laughs> right, so uh, then secondly, the, I, I want to make it worse for you before I make it better. Okay, I, I want to make it worse for you before I make it better. I want to make it better so that you all walk out of here and you see a fresh vision of who Jesus is and I want you to be compelled, impelled, driven in your spirit to worship him fresh and anew in your heart. Uh, but first, I kind of want you to catch a glimpse of your miserable self. Can I say that that way? I kind of want you to, I don't want to abuse anybody here. I want you guys to uh, see that Jesus is amazing. But one of the ways that Jesus is amazing to me is that Jesus died for a sinner, a wretch such as I. Now, I don't want to talk anybody down. That's not my point. I don't need to. Not what I'm trying to do. But I want us to take just a little bit here and, and take a look at what it is that Jesus is actually doing for us. And I, I don't want anybody becoming like truly miserable, but I want you to catch a glimpse of the imbalance of God's grace and his love uh, for us, and then to let that just turn into fodder for celebration and wonder and amazement at love so divine. That's my hope. That's my intention. I want us to meet God with humility. He died for me. He died for, for us. This is amazing. I, I have a son. I have a couple of sons, in fact. I have daughters. I've got six of them, in fact. And can I tell you that, like, if there's a church here, you know, and, and there's a fire or something like that, there's a fire and there's danger, I will gladly, I, I hope that this is completely true, I will gladly lay down my life to try to rescue anybody who's in here. But can I tell you, my children first. Right. right? My children first. I will get my children, my precious ones, to safety and then I'll come right back in and I will inhale the noxious gases and I'll throw you over my shoulder and I'll take you as far as I can and die happily to try to rescue you. But my children first. And God did not. God did not. My children are saved for all eternity. My children, my precious ones, are saved for all eternity. Tobiah. Adoniram, Azriella, Eusebia, Chloe and Jael. They've made their profession of faith. They've been baptized in obedience. They are saved. They are safe because God allowed his son to pay the penalty to die for my kids. I want that to be, I want that to be impactful. That you, can, that you can, and I know that it is. I know that it is, right? I'm not, I'm not talking over the top of you guys. Your hearts are in tune with mine, and I know that, that we're in this together. We want to celebrate this Lord who has laid down his life, allowed his son to die a terrible death in order that the ones that are precious to us can be rescued eternally. Amen? Is that a big deal? I think that that is a big deal. I really love my people, and I am so glad that they get to be saved, that they get to be eternally protected and safe and celebrate. It's an amazing thing. So, so I want to bring some of this into uh, sharp contrast with, um, with anything that even remotely smacks of deserving. 
How arrogant to even try to stand before God and pretend like there's any merit or, or like we've somehow earned God's favor or anything like that. And again, I don't want to abuse anybody. I'm not wanting to talk anybody down. I just simply want to see the contrariety of how deep the Father's love for us, that he would allow his son to die for a sinner such as I. Can you say that this morning? So, John chapter 6, starting at verse 47, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, and they died. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven, so that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread also which I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Then the Jews began to argue with one another, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in yourselves. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up on, that last, on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread which came down out of heaven, not as the fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. Amen. Amen. So the title of today's sermon is How to Exploit an Innocent Man properly. We don't want to just go around exploiting innocent men, but there is uh, a way of exploiting an innocent man properly. And we want to make sure that if we're going to do it, that we do it the right way. Amen? I mean, this is a Baptist church after all, right? We're going to exploit, we want to do it the right way. Uh, doesn't that sound terrible? I worded it that way on, par on purpose. Okay. So um, today we're going to be talking about the blood specifically. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the uh, flesh, but we're going to be talking about the blood specifically. Too much to get everything in all over the place. Verse 47, um, I, I'm going to try to reduce things down just too much, okay? So you're going to have to go back and read uh, again after we get through this. But he says, I want you to believe. And if you believe, you have eternal life. He, he says, I am the bread, okay? The, the, the bread of life, I, that's me. I am that bread. So he's speaking symbolically, uh, but he's trying to make a point here. So the Exodus generation, verse 49 says, the Exodus generation was utterly dependent on God. You see that they went from Egypt and they were given freedom and they were taken through the waters and they were under the attack of uh, Egypt's uh, Pharaoh's army and they come out on the other side of that thing and they have the guidance of the, the Holy Spirit and the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud but they're taken out into a wilderness and you know what wilderness, wildernesses are not known for? Food and water. <laughs> so they go out and they are utterly dependent upon God as they go out there and God being God provides for them even when they're less than gracious even when they are less than grateful even when they are sort of bitter and arguing and, and the Lord provides for them anyway because he is good okay because he is good so the Exodus generation was utterly dependent on God and they were cared for it says um, that uh, in verse 49 it says, your fathers ate the manna in the wilderness and they died. That, that doesn't need to be quite so like, you know, so heavy. But it's just to say that they were provided for and cared for even though they were told, go into the promised land, go into the promised land, go into the promised land. They said, no. And God says, okay, well, I'm going to provide for you and I'm going to care for you anyway. 
all the way until the grave. I'm going to give to you, and I'm going to give to you, and if you don't want to go in, I'm not going to force you to go in. I'll care for you. I will feed you. I will give you water. I will protect you all the way until you meet the grave. Okay? Even though you were disobedient, even though you didn't do what it was that I told you to do. And your kids, they're going to be the ones who are going to wind up going in. And, you know, you've just effectively made life a lot harder for your kids because they're the ones that are going to have to go in. But I'll provide for you. I'll take care of you. Okay, that's, that's, what, he's, that's what he's saying there. Verse 50. Um, is that it for God's care? If you go there, uh, this, this is the bread which came down out of heaven so that one may eat of it and not die. So it, do we just get bread and do we just get water and do we just get provided for until we die? Is that it? Is that all that God gives? Is that all that God offers? And the answer is exceedingly beyond no. Uh, God gives so much more. So um, if it was just that way, then I want you to see this, that if it was just that God was gracious to sinners, people who said, no, I'm not going into the, the uh, promised land like you told me to do. I'm going to be disobedient. And God provided for them until death. If that was it, then that would mean that death wins. Right? Uh, God is gracious. God is loving. God is kindly. But it would mean that death wins. So is there anything else? Is there anything more? Does God have more for us? And the answer to that is a very obvious and a resounding yes. He has living bread himself living bread and it goes this way I die and you get to live I'll, I'll take it it'll be on me I'll die and and you get to live eternally so eat flesh drink blood because you know life feeds on life but uh, I think ultimately when you get to what it is that food and drink are they're actually, we think of them as being integral parts of how we live and we make a big deal out of meals in our lives and stuff, and, and we ought to, but food was given, it seems, in order to sort of make a point. Food actually exists in order to help us to know that we're dependent on life from outside ourselves. This is where n nutrition and whatnot comes from. You have to take a plant and you have to kill it in order to eat it, in order to live because that life has now nourished you. If you're going to eat, um, so my, my son said, if we're not supposed to eat meat, why are animals made out of food? I agree, I agree. So um, when, you, when you eat a, a deer or when you eat a chicken or when you eat a whatever, it was alive and then it died and now life feeds on life. And for those of you who are vegetarian or making vegan choices or whatever, I hope you can still appreciate that even the plant life is, uh, has died in order to be metabolized and, and these sort of things. So all of this is to say that we are cared for and we see in life that life feeds on life and ultimate life has to feed on ultimate life and eternal life has to feed on eternal life. Without that, it's just simply not uh, going to be uh, available. Hopefully all that makes sense. And that he points to uh, the rising from the dead. It's not merely as simple as you die and you go to heaven. There's going to be a resurrection where our bodies, our physical selves are going to rise corporeal, tangible, extended, bodily, rising from the dead. Death does not win. Life wins. We will rise from the dead and Jesus will give to us new bodies, new bodies that will live forever and are fit for heaven. These bodies as they are, they are not quite fit for all of that. Can I get an amen? amen. That's right. You're going to get a new one, everybody. You're going to get a new one. So, um, the, uh, the eating of food is not merely a utility. There's some you are what you eat stuff that goes on. All right, so um, we are, uh, I'm going to say this, I'm going to move on because time's getting past me. We are utterly dependent on God for, um, for our lives. I don't think I'm telling anybody anything that you don't already know. A sunbeam is utterly dependent on the sun for its existence, right? Well, we are like sunbeams. We are extensions in that way. Utterly, completely dependent for our existence the same sort of way that a sunbeam is on the sun itself. 
we are um, in that way uh, super dependent. Okay, so we're going to talk about the blood, and I'm going to try to make this somewhat fast. But do you know? Do you know what Jesus means when he's talking about drinking his blood? We kind of talk about like uh, taking the Lord's table and drinking the the juice or the wine or whatever. Well, there's actually uh, the the phrase drinking the blood of someone. That's actually something that's been with the Jews for a little while. So we're going to go back to 1 Corinthians. Uh, no, Chronicles. I did that. I did that. 1 Chronicles uh, chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. Short little story. 1 Chronicles chapter 11. And what we've got is David and the, uh, the army that he has. And there's the Philistines, the, the people who are in the promised land, not supposed to be in the promised land. They were supposed to come in and make a clean sweep and, and all that. They did not, so the Philistines are still there. And even in the time of David, they're still battling this thing out in the promised land. Williker sakes. But here's David, and he is, um, his hometown is Bethlehem, right? The Philistines have taken over Bethlehem, where he's from. And so he's got, he's now the king, he's the king, and he's got his army with him, and part of his army is this crack regiment of 30 mighty men, and of the 30 mighty men, there's three that are even better than those 30, and the three mighty men are absolutely amazing, and they are fantastic, and they are warrior deluxes, and they are like just this amazing crack regiment of three guys who are unstoppable. So. Uh, this is where we find ourselves. David, he's looking across the way. He's in a cave, a uh, stronghold with the mighty men and everybody, and uh, looking over there, man, Bethlehem, there's my hometown, and it's being overrun by the Philistines. So that's where we find ourselves in the story. Go to verse 15. It says, Now three of the thirty chief men went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam while the army of the Philistines was camping in the valley of Rephaim. David was in the stronghold while the garrison of the Philistines was there in Bethlehem, his hometown. David had a craving and said, Oh, that someone would give me water to drink from the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. So, careful what you ask for. The three mighty men, so the three broke through the camp of the Philistines and drew water from the well of Bethlehem, which was by the gate, and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, David would not drink it, but poured it out to the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me before my God that I should do this. Shall I drink the blood of these men who went at the risk of their lives, for at the risk of their lives they brought it. Therefore he would not drink it. These things the three mighty men did. All right. So why, uh, when Jesus says drink blood, why is it that he says that? Because cannibalism is a no-no in the Bible, and you're not supposed to do that, and it's not advised, and it's bad for you. And besides that, it's yucky. It's just okay. It's not good. So, um, who is David? He's the king. He's the king. Let's hold these categories in our thinking. David is the king. Who are the three mighty men? Soldiers. And? The, the best. The best. These are the most physically capable warriors of all all of Israel and, and every, these are the most capable, these three. They are the standout uh, superheroes, okay? The most capable, the strongest. Uh, and what is it that, I mean, this is, this is wartime. This is not like they're out playing tiddlywinks. This is not like they're having a wrestle and match or something like that. This is wartime. This is absolute mortal conflict. You mess around, you make a mistake, you get dead. Right? We're playing for keeps here. We're going to use sharp things, and we're going to poke you, and we want you to stop breathing. We want you to hurt. Okay? It's war type of stuff. So absolute mortal conflict of war. People are, are dying, you know, if you just do something wrong. And here's David. And David is looking out over Bethlehem. What sort of emotions are going on here? 
There's going to be a little bit of like, oh, that chap's my hide that you're hanging out at my front door. I don't like that at all. But there's also then this sort of nostalgia, this like wistful, oh, my hometown. And he has what the Bible calls a craving. He has a craving. I want some of that water from the Bethlehem well. Oh, man, if only somebody would go down there and get me just a drink of the water from that well. It's not like they don't have things to drink in the camp. I mean, that would be, that would be nonsense for them to go out and, and have a campaign there and have nothing to drink. It's not like they have nothing to drink. That's not the point. He is having a craving, a craving. It's not even a necessity, uh, exactly. It, it's a craving. So they're trying to do what? The three mighty men, what are they trying to do? Impress the king. Yeah, who said that? You're exactly right. Yes, they're trying to impress the king. What else are they trying to do? Hey, hey, did you see what I just did there? Eh, eh, yeah, one of the three? One of the three. That's me. Right, they're trying to, I'm sure, bolster their reputation. They're trying to uh, uh, be impressive. Um, I think that they want to please the king. And I, I think that they want to uh, offer him a, a gift and they want to show, they want to show their dedication to the king, right? All those sort of things. So they, these guys are nuts, okay? So they go down into the middle of the Philistine camp and they go to the, you don't, it's not like you have the mowing faucet and you get a glass of water and then you take off, right? They actually have to go to a well. There's a little process that goes with this. And, um, you know, it's not, even one of the, it's not even like the pump handle, right? They don't even have that thing. So they've got to actually, like, dip the bucket and these kind of things and then be able to run the vessel back and offer to the king, here's this drink. And David recognizes something's afoot here that does not belong. Thank God for David's wisdom, because this could have set up a very serious precedent where you've got the mighty men are going to start offering themselves up in what seems like abject worship of the king. And if David would not have been pretty shrewd about this, he could have set up a precedent where there could have been very risky, very dangerous uh, death-defying matches and games or whatever in order to try to vaunt and elevate the king and uh, David recognizes I'm just a mortal and what they just did think about the gravity of what it was that just happened these three guys probably have families and whether they do or not they are individual human beings whose lives have some value for sure now, thank God that they're warriors and they know that they could meet their end. These are not just jokers off the street. But at the same time, that level of devotion, that doesn't belong to a mortal king. I don't care if he is the king. That level of devotion where you just cast yourself before the king and let peril happen just on a whim because of a king's craving, no, that doesn't belong there. Wisdom says we've got to do something to shut that kind of behavior down because we don't want the king being a worshipped entity. So there are kings who have tried to be that way. It's not good. David has the wisdom to say, look, th this, should, this should not continue. This should not go any further than this. There's only one who is worthy of the kind of worship of laying down your life. Now, maybe if there's a, a need uh, you put your life at peril for someone else to rescue them or something along those lines But because there's a craving for water to go do that. So David says far be it from me I cannot accept this. This is beyond what is appropriate to give to any king any human being I'm gonna pour it out to the Lord you guys don't don't do that. Okay, that's too much It is inappropriate. Can you see how it's that look that's Thank you for being generous. That is inappropriate for you to put your life in peril for something as simple as me getting a drink. Does that make sense how I'm explaining that? And David recognizes that it's inappropriate. He doesn't want to encourage that kind of behavior because it's not going to work out for the good in the long run. And he knows I'm just some guy. God's put me in the place of being the king, but I'm just some guy. Thank God for his humility. But what I want you to see is that... Uh, there's only one who is worthy of such devotion, and it's not David, right? It's no mortal uh, human being. 
But this Jesus, he's going to borrow something that's being said here. David says, should I drink these men's blood? Okay, what does he mean when he says that? Did they, I thought they brought back water. They did bring back water, didn't they? Did they bring blood? Did they, like, cut themselves and pour that into the vessel? Why, why did he say, should I drink these men's blood? Well, it's an idiom. You guys know what an idiom is, right? It's uh, like it's raining cats and dogs or that kind of a, a phrase, a statement. And he is saying, mortal peril. Should I? The, the way that it would come across in English these days is, should I take advantage of these guys this way? And not just advantage, okay? I want you to hear this. Should I take dirty advantage? Should I take dirty advantage of these guys? Like, it's not just somebody has done something extravagant and offered you something out of a deep place. This is, this is taking dirty advantage of these people. Should I drink their blood? Should I, uh, um, you know, to, to that level, to that degree? And that's what the phrase drinking blood actually means. David says, oh my goodness, man, should I, should I take dirty advantage of these guys that way? No, that would not be good for me to do. Now that is where Jesus gets the phrase of drinking blood. Because Jesus, yes, I know he is going to perish. Yes, I know he is going to bleed. Yes, I know he is going to be whipped and he's going to be marred, and he's going to actually have the, the nails, and he's going to have the, the spear in the side. Yes, there is bleeding that is going to be involved. So how much more dramatic is this that he didn't uh, just offer, but he actually died? He didn't, he didn't just go through the motions, but he actually died. But the phrase about drinking my blood is about taking dirty advantage of somebody. So I want you to see this because the, uh, the, the depth of just how low of a thing this would be, it is uh, exploiting an innocent man. You know, should I, should I exploit these people? Should I drink their blood this way? And he's got the, the king, the king. We've got the most capable people. We've got military conquest. We've got, you know, on this side of the story. And then if you look at it, it's almost like a photographic negative over here. We've got the roles are reversed. It's not soldiers who know that their position is to quite possibly lay down their lives. We've got civilians. And we've got grandmas. And we've got children. And we've got, and we've got uh, Jesus, who is the king, the one who actually is worthy of worship. And we've turned it upside down, and we've said, we're going to have the king, the one who is most worthy, the one who really, if there was anybody who was worth dying for, it would be Jesus, this king. And he switches it upside down, and he says, I am going to die for you. And uh, there's going to hopefully be a little bit of a recoiling there where you go, wait, wait, wait. No, you should never die for me. Peter goes through this, doesn't he? No, 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 you shouldn't die for me. That's, no, that's not right. That's not how this should go. And Jesus rebukes him and says, get behind me, Satan. You're not, you don't know what you're talking about. But Jesus says, look, everybody, the situation is desperate. There is only one way out. And that one way is going to be, you're going to have to actually humble yourselves so I want you to see where this, this, if you look at it one way, it is the dirtiest, it is the most advantage-taking, exploiting kind of a thing that you could do to let this person willfully walk into their death so that you can survive, okay? You come over to my house and uh, we say, hey, would you like to eat? And you say, yeah, sure, I could probably take something to eat. And I take my kids' plate, and I, with my hand, I like scrape their plate onto a new plate. And I, each of my kids, I empty their plates, and I put it on a plate, and I put it before you. And then my kids, with their big sad eyes, they look at you as you sit down at their table, and your job is now to eat their meal. You comfortable with that? I'm not. I'm not comfortable with that. But what Jesus says is, look, the situation is desperate. 
if you don't take dirty advantage of me, if you don't take the gift that I'm offering to you, there's only one way out here. There's only one, okay? And if you don't humble yourself to the place where you're willing to eat my kids' meal, you're not going to survive. You're not going to make it, okay? And it is worth it to me that, uh, says God the Father, it is worth it to me that my kid should not have food, you know, in the illustration, you're getting what I'm saying, that your plate should be full and his should be empty. It's worth it to me because otherwise you're not going to make it. So Jesus takes it upon himself to not just offer you an advantage, but to offer you this level of an advantage where he ought to be the one receiving our worship. I want to be very careful. I am not saying that God is worshiping you, but I want you to know that the word worship comes from the Anglo-Saxon contraction worth-ship, okay? What is somebody worth or what is something worth? And he says, I'm willing to pay this price. Now, I think he overpaid, frankly, okay? But it's not up to me to establish this. It is what Jesus himself and what God the Father and what the Holy Spirit have determined in their own private counsel that it is worth this to our God, that he should lay down the life of his son and that he should bleed unto death, even death on a cross, so that you could have the opportunity. Listen to the humility of this. There are people who can refuse the gift. The price paid should give you some idea of how serious this is, that Jesus wants you. But the next step to that is, it's not as though he just simply wants you to be saved all over the place. He wants you to represent him. This Jesus, the Jesus who is willing to lay down his life and bleed for you. This Jesus, he wants you to be an emissary for his kingdom. He wants you to be filled with that kind of love, to emulate that kind of love, to behave out of, as a source of behavior, that kind of love. That we should love him because he first loved us, and that we should love him with all our heart and soul and mind and strength, and that we should love our neighbor as ourselves because Jesus has first loved us to this extreme. And he says, in a remembrance of me, I want you to go ahead and have this meal, and I want you to drink this drink, because my flesh that I'm going to lay down for you, that's true food. That's how you're going to live. My blood... That's true drink. This is how you're going to live. But again, the goal is not merely it is to be saved. Please hear me. It is to be saved. And you are invited to receive the gift that Jesus has given. But it is not merely to just be saved all over the place. But to let that love influence you. And to change the way that you think about other people. Well, that person's taken advantage of me. So what should I do about that? I should love them because Jesus has loved me. Somebody takes advantage of me. I don't know about you, but my hackles get raised. And I'm like, hey, boom, you're taking advantage of me. That's not supposed to be our response, though. And you can't save anybody. You cannot die for anybody and get them saved, but you can implement what it is that Jesus has done. And you can love not out of yourself as a source, but you can love out of the Holy Spirit as a wellspring because you have first been loved to such an extreme. Is this making sense what I'm saying? The Lord has said to you, there's no way except for that you should take advantage of the gift that I am offering. Have you accepted the gift that Christ has offered? It is a, a, an incredible gift that he would lay down his life so that you could be with him because he has control and power over life. He raised his own self up on the third day physically, and he can raise us up in the resurrection so that we can be with him always and forever in celebration of his good grace. Amen? Amen. Anybody looking forward to it? I am. I am. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you have done such an amazing thing, performed such an incredible feat. 
more mighty than the mighty men, more incredible is this feat than any feat that we've ever seen. And you have done it for us. We know who we are. We know what we have done. We know that we have come up short. We know that we are sinners. We know that we have told you no. But Lord, we want to be different and we want to be better for you. Thank you that you have loved us. And Lord, you have. We acknowledge it. You have loved us. We can't even, we're not even in the place where we can really question that. You have loved us to such a degree, to the uttermost. But Lord, there is so much need for your spirit to continually fill us, continually love us, continually show us so that we can be your people loving for you as your representatives, your emissaries in this world. And we know that it's going to be costly because we've seen what it is that it's cost you. Help us that we wouldn't exclude ourselves uh, from your work because somebody might take advantage of us. Instead, let us offer up the advantage like you did. Help us to be humble enough to see our need and humble enough to offer the advantage. Thank you, God, that you have loved us. Forgive us. We know we need forgiveness. And Lord, now empower us to be your people for your name's sake, for your renown. We pray it in the name of Jesus, our King. Amen.